Yes, uh, there, um, the, there was a, a, uh, a document circulated that got that, that uh, requested a special meeting and, and uh, two specific uh, or, or two items to be discussed. It was signed by a majority of the uh, count uh, of the committee members. So therefore, if uh, it would be appropriate for the, uh, the <coughs> chair to hold the, the committee to, to ensure that they met what they signed.
and since we are a necessary party and we cannot be feasibly joined because of sovereign immunity, this case must be dismissed. Uh, this uh, uh, legal theory has been used in a number of cases uh, concerning uh, uh, tribal membership. Uh, the Santa Clara Pueblo uh, uh, is probably the foremost case in, in that uh, legal realm. And additionally, uh, uh, it has also been used in Nero versus the Cherokee Nation Tenth Circuit case, uh, wherein uh, a, a freedman descendant filed suit to gain citizenship rights. The Tenth Circuit ruled that the Cherokee Nation was a necessary party, but there but could not be easily joined, so the case was dismissed. So, our uh, or the, the case that we're talking about here today ruled the opposite. I like I said, that we are a necessary party, that we can be feasibly uh, joined. And the reason why we could be feasibly joined was that um, under the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, the United States Constitution, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll read it, it says, neither slavery or involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Uh, Judge uh, Kennedy reasoned that the 13th Amendment coupled with the 1866 Civil Rights Act put the 13th Amendment to all individuals in the United States, including Indian tribes. They further say that the Treaty of 1866 <coughs> specifically right, grants freedmen and their descendants all privileges of citizenship to the Cherokee Nation. And uh, I get and, and correct me if I'm wrong. The reasoning goes that you have, you have the Treaty of 1866. Uh, you have the, the 13th Amendment. You have the Treaty of 1866. Two months later, you have the, uh, the 1866. Civil Rights Act, and that the 1866 Civil Rights Act was the necessary uh, legislation by Congress to uh, bring forward that uh, those rights. Now, this is um, as, I, as I stated earlier, this is contrary to a number of cases particularly in the Tenth Circuit, wherein the, uh, the legal, I guess the, the basic legal doctrine, doctrine is that Indian tribes will be able to control their citizenship and that the United States will not interfere with, with that based on our quasi-sovereign status. Uh, this is a major departure from that main body of law. Uh, Judge Kennedy cites... Uh, some very uh, well, interesting cases. The uh, probably the most interesting, uh, the, and, and I and I hope everyone has, has got a chance to read the uh, uh, Kennedy uh, opinion. I do have some other opinions that I've uh, of cases that he has cited that are available if you want to uh, get a copy of them. But uh, uh, there's a one is the United States. Court of Claims case, Whitmire versus the Cherokee Nation and the United States, uh, wherein basically it ruled that the uh, freedmen descendants are uh, have the ability have the ability to share in the proceeds of the sale of land when that took place. So this is an 1895 case, uh, and uh, and I would encourage everyone to to, to read that case. It, Later, this Whitmire case was mentioned in uh, a United States Supreme Court case, Daniel Redbird versus the Cherokee Nation, uh, uh, citing the, the Whitmire case uh, to the effect that the Delawares, the Shawnees, and Freedmen acquired their property rights by the express words of the treaties, and specifically setting out the Treaty of 1866 between the United States and the Cherokee Nation provided as to the former slaves that they should be free and that their descendants shall have the rights of native territories. So that that is the, the 
oh, case law behind uh, Judge Kennedy's decision. Uh, in one <coughs> instance, he cited a treatise or a law review article. Uh, well, it's the Berkeley Journal of African American Law and Policy. And I would, would highly recommend that all the counselors get a copy of this and read it. It will be <coughs> obviously made available to you. But this law journal basically set out the roadmap for Judge Kennedy's decision. And um, it's, I mean, it, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, it pretty much puts it out there almost verbatim. Uh, and in that uh, uh, article, it discussed uh, sovereign immunity, discussed, you know, how this is a novel and new approach uh, to uh, assert the rights of uh, freedom of descendants. And I would highly recommend everyone read those articles. Um, so I've told you who, what, and why, and where do we go from here? Uh, the number of uh, available to, to the Turkey Nation uh, Miller would probably be the most protest and uh, ask those questions. Uh, or Ms. Hammond. That they've had that set up. And uh, <coughs> Wesley is interlocutory appeal. This is a subject matter of jurisdiction question that can be taken up immediately. Uh, it is, uh, uh, or uh, the, possibly, uh, the possibility of having the case, uh, attempting to have the case transferred from the D.C. Circuit to the Tenth Circuit uh, for a, a form of convenience uh, issue. And there's a lot of legal, uh, interesting legal issues that, uh, that go along with those options. But um, th those, are, those are some, and, and I'm going to hesitate to get into in the detail of these legal options because obviously we're in a public meeting and I would be hesitant to uh, go forward uh, with uh, detailed uh, legal positioning in, in this meeting. Be that said, that concludes my portion of the uh, briefing as to that case, and I would turn it over to Ms. Hannon if she had anything to, to add. It might be appropriate, are we just asked to hear from Mr. Miller, and then maybe I can see how the hand is working. Not, Not yet, Diane. <laughs> 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 probably working. All right. Um, Mr. Hembree did a, a very fine job of outlining it for you. Let me um, express to you, if I can, uh, my concerns with this decision. And my primary concerns with this decision have very little to do with uh, the citizenship rights of the freedmen. What really concerns me about this decision is the possibility of the overreaching effects of this novel idea of an abrogation or doing away with sovereign immunity. As you've probably all heard, in order to find a waiver of sovereign immunity, there has to be a clear, a clear expression of that by Congress or a declaration by the tribe itself. We do waivers of sovereign immunity here. We do them in open session. We argue about their terms. That's appropriate. Or Congress can do it for us. When Congress does it via special legislation or in some type of law, they have to specifically say so. That is a well-established principle in Indian law. Judge Kennedy's decision, um, and I made some notes, let me look at them, finds a waiver of sovereign immunity out of this marriage of the 13th Amendment, which is the anti-slavery amendment, and our 1866 treaty, and finds that somehow those two things combined express, express clear congressional intent. That's a novel holding. Um, he tries to, um, and the bar, uh, the law review article that is cited very heavily, um, tries to narrowly tailor that. But it's very, very frightening to me because that's a departure, and that could set a roadmap for waivers of sovereign immunity to be found down the road on other issues. That, to me, is the most disturbing part of Judge Kennedy's holding and the parts that I feel most strongly about appealing um, or challenging in some way. Um, you know, when we, we, as lawyers, we joke, you don't have the 
law on your side, rely on the facts. If you don't have your the, the facts on your side, you know, pound on the podium. Um, what Judge Kennedy did, he said that um, it was clear because of principles of the 13th Amendment. There's no express law in the 13th Amendment. says anything about Indian tribes or whatever you saw immunity. But the principles of the 13th Amendment, the corresponding Civil Rights Act of 1866, considered in the context of history, equated to a waiver of sovereign immunity. I find that very disturbing. So that is um, primarily my issue with the case. Um, it was a preliminary order on our, we intervened only in the limited respect to contest, the mo to file the motion to dismiss. We are not parties to the lawsuit yet. Um, that motion to dismiss was denied and the Friedman uh, plaintiffs made a motion to add the nation and its officials um, as parties in their second amended complaint and that was granted. Um, as of the last time we checked, um, we had not been added um, nor had anyone been served. So that's the status of the case. Because the United States is a party, um, there's extended response times. Anytime the United States is a party, the usual timelines are extended quite a bit. Uh, so we're certainly well within our time to discuss all of our strategic options uh, appeal if we so choose. Be happy to answer any questions that you have about the family decision. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Hammond? <coughs> Pardon me. Any questions? Or of Todd? <coughs> yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a question for Ms. Hammond or Mr. Hember. What impact might uh, these proceedings have on Santa Clara versus Martinez? and the uh, ability of tribes to, for all tribes, to be able to declare their own membership? Well, it could have far-reaching effects. I mean, Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez was an Indian civil rights action case and um, came down with the proposition that that was only enforceable through habeas action. But the impact of, of, of the decision, the ultimate decision on the merits, you know, if we get, if we go farther down the road, upon tribes to determine their own membership um, is troublesome. I mean, we, you know, as 1% or less of the United States population, all that we have left is the vestiges of our government and we have to fight for every bit that remains. The right to determine our own citizenship, to make that decision ourselves is part of that. I think that's why tribes fight so vehemently for it. Um, and I think that sometimes that vehement fight to protect that right to establish citizenship is misconstrued. Um, so it can have those effects. That seems to me is one more step down the road. Right now, this step is this finding of an abrogation, a waiver of sovereign immunity where it was not clearly expressed. Just one more quick question. But by the fact that the federal district court uh, assume jurisdiction, does it, it's not it changes everything, correct? It's, not it. it's the first time that the United States has assumed jurisdiction in a tribal membership matter. Well, the, the media decision has been in federal court, but it's the it first is. time in Illinois. Right. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, the it first time this that rationale has been used. Th this case could have far-reaching implications it could, it could for all tribes. It could indeed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Anyone else? If I would uh, uh, just uh, add to what Ms. Hammond stated there, it's it's uh, the potential of it is is, is far-reaching. Obviously, I mean, uh, the uh, uh, I'm sure uh, the intent will be to narrow focus this to just badges of incident freedom uh, of, of badges or incidents of slavery those types of issues <laughs> but it, it's kind of like you know saying uh you know, you can't, you know as soon as the camel gets his nose under the tent he can get the old camel and that's going to be a slippery slope argument uh but uh the law review article states how 
state that this case, these types of cases would only be used for drug cases for very specific uh, 13th Amendment badges or instances of slavery type issues. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? <coughs> we don't have a phone yet, right? Got it? Let's blame Mr. Inlow since he just walked in <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, until we get the, the phone set up, uh, that, that concludes, I mean, unless there's any questions but, uh, of Ms. Hammond or myself, that would conclude our presentation, uh, our briefing, <coughs> as to that issue or that case, uh, which would then lead us to the briefing on the Supreme Court decision, uh, our, our Supreme Court decision. Uh, Mr. Martin? I think you might have said, I don't know if you uh, made a statement uh, that the Cherokee had, uh, that's our member, uh, made a legal position. Uh, I think it's the way you said that, but you didn't want to be one of the judges to hold the meeting. When would it be proper for you to discuss those? Well, I'm not the lead counsel in that case, so it probably wouldn't be proper for me to discuss those issues with you at all. The lead quick counsel for the Cherokee Nation is Lloyd Miller with the There are outside counsel, the Sanofsky Law Sinofsky. Firm. The outside counsel is in Canada, our limited motion to intervene in the, in the Van case. There are all sorts of strategic options uh, because of this nature of course. Very few orders that early on in the lawsuit can you go straight up to the circuit court. But this is one of them that you can. In considering whether or not to do that, we have to consider different strategies. Whether to stay in that district court, try to move to another district court, what our defenses could be in one or the other. Um, and it would be improper and ill-advised for us to discuss that with in a public setting. I would be happy to discuss it with any of you, any group of you, um, at any time, as I'm sure Mr. Henry would or Mr. Miller would, but this setting is not an appropriate time to discuss that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? We're still waiting on the phone, Dr. Mr. Miller. Well, um, as that's going, I, I will begin my print, uh, uh, the briefing as to the Supreme Court case uh, uh, with the, uh, the Cherokee Nation. Uh, on December 19th, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, on the... Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, the other top says it's ready. <laughs> uh, well, then we'll, we'll get with Mr. Miller to close this topic and, and go to the next. Lloyd Miller is with Sanofsky Law Firm in Washington, D.C., and I have, you have his number. Oh, okay. Meredith, we're um, we have we convened a uh, rules committee meeting, and uh, Ms. <coughs> Hammonds and Mr. Hembry have given us a briefing on the federal court case, and I think we may have questions of you. However, if if you wouldn't mind giving us a brief introduction, uh, we would appreciate it. Okay, Madam Speaker, I'm happy to do that. Um, let me, by way of a preliminary remark. Of course, remind everyone that I am Lloyd Miller, with a partner with the Sanofsky Chambers Law Firm. Um, and the matters I discuss with the council, and members of the council, and members of the leadership of the Cherokee Nation are privileged communications. If this is an open meeting, 
Um, that's fine. It does, however, impact the comments I'm free to make because in an open meeting, the confidentiality between attorney and client would not be protected. So I, I assume this is an open meeting and I should proceed accordingly. Am I correct? That's correct. It is an open meeting. Okay. Well, uh, you've had a briefing already, it sounds like. Um, I, what I'd like to do is go over Judge Kennedy's uh, decision, in, in not in great detail, um, but just go over it uh, by way of summary. Now, I think you're, of course, more familiar than I with the history of both the Cherokee Nation and, and how this case came to arise. Um, there was an election in May 2003, and there was also a second election later in 2003, but this lawsuit was filed to contest the first election. Uh, that's the election in which uh, the principal chief was elected and also at which the one provision of the Constitution, the one that required secretarial approval, uh, was placed before the voters and they were asked to repeal that provision of the Constitution. Uh, the voter did agree to repeal the Constitution. They also elected uh, the principal chief to the uh, position that Ted was elected, of course. And um, then the whole matter went to the Department of the Interior because of the 1970 Principal Chiefs Act uh, provisions and also because the uh, also because the provision removing secretarial approval itself had to be approved by the secretary. That sounds a little twisted, I know, but uh, once that provision is removed with the approval of the secretary, then it's out of the Constitution and future amendments no longer require uh, secretarial approval. And this was the plan. The plan was to have uh, a two step constitutional amendment process where the secretary was taken out of the process in step one and then the people were given the opportunity to consider amendments, further amendments to the Constitution in part two. And in fact, part two uh, did take place. Uh, those amendments uh, passed the voters and they were never submitted to the Department of Interior. Now, there had been um, Communications prior to the March 2003, excuse me, May 2003 election between the nation and the Secretary of Interior's representatives over the election. Uh, the nation had uh, indications from the department that the proposed amendment to remove uh, the approval requirement would go through so long as the election procedures were all proper. Um, and after the election, in due course, uh, the results of the election were acknowledged by the Department of the Interior insofar as the election of the principal chief is concerned uh, and other members of the council. However, the department never took action on the approval of the constitutional amendment itself, the amendment that removed the approval requirement. Um, and in fact, over the last five years, the, or three years, excuse me, the um, three and a half years, the Department of Interior has not taken action on that issue. Um, now you all know much better than I that there has been parallel litigation in the tribal courts, uh, but that's, you, you suffice it to say that that litigation concluded that the Department of the Interior had approved the uh, constitutional amendment removing secretarial approval. Uh, that issue was not directly before the court uh, in, the, in the case in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in fact, the judge noted he had not had a copy of that decision and was not uh, commenting on it in any way. Now, the uh, plaintiffs in the case brought a lawsuit in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few months after the election. Uh, before that lawsuit, they wrote on more than one occasion to the secretary, an assistant secretary, and asked Interior not to approve the constitutional amendment. 
Uh, their argument was that the election was defective because <coughs> Cherokee Friedman had not been allowed to participate in the election uh, that occurred in May 2003. Um, the, uh, the secretary took no action one way or the other, continued to receive information both from uh, the Cherokee Friedman representatives who were making these, uh, expressing these concerns and getting information from the Cherokee Nation. Um, but after the department recognized the election insofar as it concerned the principal chief, the Friedman decided to file a lawsuit. And a lawsuit was filed later in 2003, and then for a time, uh, as we monitored the lawsuit, we learned that there were settlement negotiations underway. Um, this uh, seemed odd, to say the least, because the settlement negotiations were occurring without the involvement of the Cherokee Nation. And the whole case, everything we're talking about, concerns the Cherokee Nation. Cherokee Nation's elections, the Cherokee Nation's constitution, the rights of people to vote in Cherokee Nation elections. Uh, and so one would think that if there are going to be some settlement negotiations, the Cherokee Nation ought to be involved. Uh, but neither the Justice Department nor the attorneys representing the plaintiffs in that case uh, invited the Cherokee Nation to the table. Well, that's fine. Uh, in response to those developments, the Cherokee Nation filed a motion to intervene, but for a very limited purpose. The Cherokee Nation's motion to intervene asked the court for permission to intervene just for the limited purpose of asking uh, the court to dismiss the case for lack of jurisdiction. And uh, this procedure is common when a sovereign, a sovereign's interests are involved in a case, but nobody has named the sovereign in the lawsuit. You see, the general rule, and I, I know the nation is familiar because you've seen the rule used in many other nation cases and, and in cases involving other tribes and involving states and even involving the United States, the general rule is a sovereign is immune from being sued. And, you, and, and a plaintiff that a plaintiff cannot get around that problem by suing somebody else if the lawsuit is really a claim against the sovereign. Uh, a court does not have jurisdiction to sue a sovereign uh, or to entertain a lawsuit against a sovereign without the sovereign's consent. So the Cherokee Nation's presentation was pretty straightforward. This was really a lawsuit that involved the sovereign Cherokee Nation's interests. The court doesn't have jurisdiction uh, for claims against the Cherokee Nation because it hasn't consented to be sued, and therefore the case cannot proceed forward. Uh, many cases over the years against the Cherokee Nation, against other Indian tribes, uh, against various states, and uh, again, even against the United States, have been dismissed because of this rule. And it's a, a sound rule rooted in the principle that if a sovereign could be sued, it would be doing very little but defending itself in lawsuits all over the land because all of its citizens would file lawsuits whenever they were uh, displeased with something the sovereign was doing. And the better process is uh, to sort those things out through the electoral process or uh, in the sovereign's own courts. And, of course, your courts are available uh, for people wishing to file lawsuits against the Cherokee Nation in certain areas. Uh, so that uh, intervention, what we call a very limited intervention, was granted by the judge. Uh, you may recall uh, that in other cases recently, uh, the Cherokee Nation has been granted limited intervention and, and eventually cases have been dismissed using this uh, same rule of law. Um, Intervention was granted early this year, and uh, then the motion to dismiss that the Cherokee Nation wanted to make was filed, 
and the issue was uh, briefed by all sides. And Judge Kennedy's decision is a resolution of that issue. What Judge Kennedy does uh, is issue, oh, I would, as I've identified them, four major rulings uh, it, that are not uh, in the Cherokee Nation's favor, if you will, and uh, five rulings that are in the Cherokee Nation's favor. I guess I'll go over the, the ones that are contrary to the Cherokee Nation's interests first. Um, the first ruling that comes up early in the judge's decision, and if you have the judge's decision, you see this ruling summarized on pages 14 and 21, is that the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, in combination with the Cherokee Nation's 1866 Treaty, abrogates or overcomes the Cherokee Nation's immunity from lawsuits involving the denial of freedmen voting rights, or I should say involving the alleged denial of freedmen voting rights. Now that's the conclusion that consumes the first two-thirds of the court's opinion. Uh, the 13th Amendment, uh, as no doubt you've already heard, is the amendment to the Constitution that outlawed slavery in the United States. Um, the judge concludes that uh, this amendment, in combination with the provisions in the 1866 treaty, and there are several provisions in the 1866 treaty that, uh, that are addressed to the Cherokee freedmen, uh, those provisions together eliminate the Cherokee Nation's sovereign immunity for this lawsuit. Now that is a, a first of its kind ruling. We have not seen a ruling like that anywhere uh, in the courts of the country. In fact, the opposite ruling was issued uh, in what's known as the Nero decision uh, many years ago involving lawsuit claims by uh, freedmen against the Cherokee Nation. And, and this is all very procedural, and I, and I don't want to get uh, too technical with, uh, with the committee, uh, but understand the arguments being made back and forth are not about whether someone has done something right or someone has done something wrong, whether the nation has acted correctly or incorrectly. Uh, the arguments at these levels of analysis are about which courts can hear certain <coughs> kinds of cases. And these are jurisdictional issues that are quite important. We know, of course, that the Cherokee Nation courts are open and, and have made uh, rulings related to these issues. The question is whether a federal court can hear these kinds of issues also. And again, summarizing this ruling, Judge Kennedy concludes that yes, the federal courts are open to hear these kinds of lawsuits because of his interpretation of the 13th Amendment combined with uh, his reading of the 1866 Treaty. Uh, now, I cannot uh, go on to the next thing without remarking that, uh, of course, there's nothing in the 1866 Treaty that says the Cherokee Nation is waiving its sovereign immunity from being sued. There's nothing, nothing explicit in there. And there's nothing in the 13th Amendment that waives anybody's immunity from being sued. It's simply not addressed in the 13th Amendment. And these are the elements that the Oklahoma court in the Nero case found conclusive in favor of the Cherokee Nation. Um, it, it, these are the elements that the court found meant that a federal court can't hear these cases. Only a tribal court could hear these cases. Uh, but you understand, of course, that what happened in Oklahoma and what happened on appeal in the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals based in Denver is not binding on Judge Kennedy. His courtroom is in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Court of Appeals there is in Washington, D.C., so it's a different branch of the federal system. Now, that's the first major ruling of the, of the decision. Uh, the second major ruling in the decision, uh, contrary, I would say, to the nation's interest, if you will, or, or that support the, the decision Judge Kennedy made, 
Uh, concerns, uh, another procedural issue. Everything here is procedural. Nowhere has the judge actually made a ruling that the Cherokee Nation acted improperly. Uh, he has not made a ruling in favor of the Freedmen, uh, as he is required to do, just incidentally. For, this, for, for purposes of this kind of a motion, the judge is required to accept as true everything the plaintiffs have alleged in the case. If everything the plaintiff alleges is true, does the federal court have jurisdiction? Now the plaintiffs will have to prove their case, uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so the second set of rulings, really two things. A federal court cannot review a federal agency's decision unless the federal agency has made a final decision. Okay, this is called the final agency action rule. It's another rule that's not substantive. It's not about whether someone did something right or wrong. Again, it's another rule that goes to whether or not a courthouse door can be opened to a case. Basically, courts don't want to decide cases that are still being massaged by a federal agency. They want to hear a case when the federal agency is through. And it was argued in this case that the federal agency was not through because it had still not made a final decision on whether to approve or disapprove of the constitutional amendment adopted in May 2003. By the way, I just want to ask if, if you can hear me well enough. Yes. Um, okay. Johnson? I'm getting a little static on my end, but that's okay. Um, the judge ruled that there are two actions here, or there are two ways in which a final agency action has occurred. First, he concluded that there was a final agency action when the results of the election for principal chiefs and council members, those results were recognized by the Department of the Interior back in 2003. And secondly, he concluded that the department's failure to act on the constitutional amendment since May 2003 amounted to a final agency action. Now that's a little bit tricky, but uh, there is a doctrine in the law that if an agency just sits on something and does nothing, and a lot of time passes, then a court can deem the agency to have decided to take no action and view that as a final agency action, which the court can then review to decide if it was legal or not. Um, so on both of these bases, the court finds that there is a final agency action, two final agency actions, and he therefore has jurisdiction in that sense as well. Now, uh, the next area where the judge ruled that um, he could proceed was in considering whether or not the plaintiffs had to first go to tribal court. Uh, on the one hand, the Cherokee Nation had explained to the judge, look, our tribal courts are open and the freedmen can express themselves and pursue their claims in the tribal courts. Now this was very theoretical in the beginning of the case, but as the case wore on, we were actually able to share with Judge Kennedy the Allen decision from the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court, uh, which was an example, not only of a freedman claim being brought in tribal court, but a freedman claim prevailing in tribal court. Um, the judge, and, and, and I should add that Again, another one of these jurisdictional rules. A federal court will not look at an issue that it could otherwise look at if a plaintiff can go to tribal court first. Um, but here, the judge acknowledged that Friedman can go to tribal court, and he acknowledged the Allen decision. He, he was aware of it and had read it. Uh, but he said that this lawsuit is really a lawsuit against the Secretary of the Interior. And the Secretary of the Interior cannot be sued in tribal court. In other words, a plaintiff could not name Secretary Kempthorne 
in the Cherokee Nation's court and get a ruling against the secretary because the secretary is not subject to being sued in any court other than a federal court. <coughs> can't be sued in state court, can't be, can only be sued in federal court. So Judge Kennedy rejected the suggestion the Cherokee Nation made that all of this should first be heard in-house inside the Cherokee Nation's courts. And finally, uh, and perhaps uh, in some respects of, of greatest concern on this call, would be the court's ruling that the lawsuit can name tribal officials individually uh, and isn't just limited to naming the uh, Cherokee Nation itself. Uh, in this area, the judge pointed out that uh, there, is, there is no claim of money damages. Uh, the plaintiff is not trying to get money damages against individual tribal officials. Um, that this is a lawsuit just for uh, what we call injunctive relief for an order declaring what people's rights are and for prospective relief, an order directing that things happen in the future to carry out whatever rights Judge Kennedy finds the plaintiffs have. And because it's that kind of a lawsuit, just litigation over what people's rights are and how people should behave in the future in their official capacities, uh, this kind of a lawsuit against tribal officials is not barred. And you know, it, it's a bit of an odd area for, I think, every official to understand uh, and be comfortable with, and, and I mean this in sort of an intellectual way, the courts understand that the official is being sued as an official, not as a private person. Otherwise, they wouldn't be sued at all. But the court system will pretend that the person, in a way, is not acting as an official if the person did something the person wasn't permitted to do. Now, the freedmen say that Cherokee Nation officials cannot deny them voting rights. If the freedmen are correct, then it means when a Cherokee Nation official denies a freedman person voting rights, that official is acting beyond the authority that that official has. And so the law, the federal court system, pretends that that official is acting as a private person, not as, a, as an official person, because by definition you can in your official acts, you can only do the things you're authorized to do. You cannot do the things you're not authorized to do. Uh, but in these cases, in fact, the official is being sued in the official's official capacity. So I, I know it makes people uncomfortable. Does this mean I'm subject to personal liability? Uh, again, this is not a lawsuit seeking damages. Um, never has been. Uh, it's not what the case is about. Um, so that's a summary of the rulings that went against the nation. I should quickly summarize for you five points that uh, where Judge Kennedy agreed with the Cherokee Nation. Um, maybe six points. Uh, first, the judge ruled that, uh, and he indicated this very quickly on page 20, that the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution doesn't apply to the Freedmen's Claims. Also on page 20, same sentence, he said the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States doesn't apply to the Freedmen's Claims. On page 21, uh, and this is addressed in a footnote, the court rules that the Cherokee Nation sovereign immunity is not waived by the Indian Civil Rights Act. And that's an important reaffirmation of the law handed down by the Supreme Court many years ago uh, in the Martinez case, uh, Santa, Clara, Santa Clara Pueblo case, excuse me. And uh, under the Indian Civil Rights Act, if a person has a concern about rights being violated under that act, the person needs to go to tribal court, not federal court, unless they're being subject to a restriction on their liberty, in which case they can file a habeas corpus petition in federal court, but that's the only uh, exception, and that's the law the Supreme Court announced. The Freedmen wanted the federal court, Judge Kennedy, to 
make a broader ruling, but he declined to do that. Uh, the judge also ruled that the 1898 Curtis Act does not abrogate, abrogate the Cherokee Nation's sovereign immunity because it was repealed. Um, and that was another argument the plaintiffs were pursuing in front of Judge Kennedy. And also on page 21, the judge reaffirmed, and, and this has been an important principle in prior litigation, this will continue being important for the Cherokee Nation in future litigation. The judge reaffirmed on page 21 that a sovereign Indian tribe can intervene in a case for the limited purpose of challenging the court's jurisdiction without being viewed as having waived its sovereign immunity because it stepped into the case. You can step into the case just on a limited basis. You know, ordinarily, if you step into a case and get involved, you're subject to the jurisdiction of the court for all purposes. Uh, but the judge upheld uh, the position adopted by several other lower courts across the country that a tribe or a state can step into a case just for a limited purpose to protect their sovereignty and ask the court to dismiss a case. Uh, the last the rulings in favor of the, I think, that are in favor of the Cherokee Nation are on page 27, where the judge underscores that he only has jurisdiction over these claims arising under the 13th Amendment and the 1866 Treaty. He has no jurisdiction. He's not going to listen to any claims involving violations of the Indian Civil Rights Act or of the Cherokee Constitution. Uh, again, here he's recognizing that claims arising under a tribal constitution belong in a tribal court and not in a federal court. So the, there are aspects of the ruling that are very broad in terms of the implied waiver of sovereign immunity altogether, but there are other aspects of the ruling that are narrow and show how Judge Kennedy intends to limit the scope of the case he will decide. Let me um, very briefly now tell you uh, what may come next in the case. Um, the Cherokee Nation has uh, a number of alternatives available to it at this point, um, and we are still studying the case and the Cherokee Nation's options and are conferring with the Attorney General for the Nation over how to proceed. It is possible to uh, appeal, of course, Judge Kennedy's ruling, either now or later. Um, uh, certainly the Cherokee Nation doesn't think that uh, if litigation is going to go forward, it ought to go forward over in Washington, D.C. Um, you may recall years ago the uh, Cherokee's litigation the unfortunate litigation that occurred with the Delaware tribe uh, took place in Oklahoma. Um, I think we all think it'd be better if uh, these cases are heard close to home, less costly for everybody involved. Um, so that's another issue out there. And uh, finally, if there are no appeals taken now, and regardless of where this case is ultimately heard, there would be uh, possibly a trial there might be, uh, there might well be uh, the discovery process. And I don't know how many of the council members have been involved in that, but that is where depositions can be taken by either side of the other side's employees or officials who have knowledge that can be useful to the judge in the case. Uh, there may be requests on both sides for the production of documents. There may be written questions submitted by both sides. Uh, all of these sorts of things the judge will have to establish in a pretrial schedule. So there would be a planning meeting and a schedule would be laid out, laying out deadlines by which various things have to occur. Now sometimes that process is cut short because one side or the other side files a motion asking the judge to rule that they win just based on the information available right then and there without going through some of these other procedures. Uh, and that's perfectly permissible. And sometimes those motions are successful, sometimes they're not. Um, right now it's just too early to tell and predict for the Rules Committee 
uh, what the ultimate scope of the case could be. That concludes the remarks I hope to make and, and share with the Rules Committee. Uh, Madam Speaker, if there are questions that I can answer, I'm delighted to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, are there any questions of Mr. Miller at this time? Any comments? Any questions? I guess not, uh, Lloyd, so we'll take you off the clock. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll go back to my my salt mines. All right. Thank, thank you so much for being available. I want to wish you all a very happy new year and, and to you, Meredith, personally, a thank warm you. happy new year and a prosperous and successful meeting. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Yes. I got a question, Tom. On page six, there's a memorandum to the board. Uh, number one, seeking the secretary's approval. On page six, there's supposed to be a letter March the 15th that was written by Mr. McTaylor and signed by him. Did we get a copy of that letter? Yes, sir. That's a letter of March 15, 2008. I'm sure we can get that. Anyone else? Mr. Larry? Item 2 is a resolution rescinding the previous council resolution 6306. Ma Madam Chairman? Yes. Um, it is in the indulgence of the committee, but we, we really just completed the first half of the briefing, which was on the federal court itself. Oh, okay. The agenda also called for a briefing on the uh, Church Nation Supreme Court case. Uh, I'm prepared to give a briefing. It's the pleasure of the council if they want to go forward on that. Okay. Anybody object? Okay, please do. Thank okay. you. On December 19th, uh, 2006, the uh, Cherokee Nation Supreme Court issued a ruling on the, uh, uh, what I will just call that, the, the, the petition, the Freedman petition. Uh, 
it is a petition that would call for a constitutional amendment to the Cherokee Nation Constitution that uh, would uh, specifically uh, disenfranchise the the, the, pre the freedmen descendants. Uh, there, there was a uh, petition circulated, a number of sign signatures gathered. Those signatures went, uh, there's a little 3,000 signatures gathered. It went to the Cherokee Nation Election Commission, the Election Commission, through their cursory review, uh, I think deleted around 800 signatures, <coughs> leaving approximately 2,300. The, uh, the signatures needed was, I want to say, 2,187, um, but uh, it's around 2,100. Um, after the Cherokee Nation uh, Election Commission certification, that uh, there was a protest filed uh, uh, by the uh, uh, by a, a, a freedman descendant. There was a court case held, and that decision ruled that there was uh, uh, absolutely qualified 2,175 signatures, which was uh, more than the 2,087 necessary to propose the constitutional amendment. And the court uh, also ruled that the uh, uh, principal chief had the authority to call a special election on an initiative petition. The basis of uh, there, there was it was a three-two decision. Justices uh, Matlock, Wilcox, and Haskins uh, wrote for the majority. Justices Dowdy and Leaves uh, both wrote uh, individual dissenting opinions. Uh, the real crux of the issue here was that there was allegations of fraud in the petition process, and that uh, uh, specifically Leaves and Dowdy, uh, it, it, for the dissent, ruled that, 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 that there was obviously fraud committed and that uh, so much to the point that the petition process should be invalidated. The majority ruled that although there may have been fraud committed and what if there had been fraud committed, it should be uh, uh, forwarded to the Marshal Service for best investigation. Um, Mr. Ambridge, just a moment. I'm sorry. We have cell phones turned off. I'm sorry I didn't remind you to please turn off your cell phones so that it isn't disruptive. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry. That's right. The, uh, well, uh, in, in particularly, uh, you know, uh, well, I, it could be argued that all the justices ruled that there were there obviously something occurred that the marshal service should investigate and it's my understanding now that that has been reported to the marshal service for investigation the uh, it, the i guess the validity of the signatures comes down to if it is determined that a circulator committed fraud is it just that one petition with their signatures that are thrown out or all the uh, uh, petitions that that circulator certified are thrown out? The court ruled that if there are fraud, that if there is fraud committed, that only that particular sheet is thrown out unless by other evidence the remainder of those signatures can be verified. Okay? Uh, that, that, that is the nutshell of the ruling there. Uh, uh, the uh, court ruled that obviously the election could go forward and um, that's where we stand at this point. No, I just will affirm that um, after we received the opinion um, and the first dissent, um, which mentioned impropriety, are there any questions concerning the uh, uh, the Supreme Court ruling on the petition itself? And I would remind uh, the counselors. Uh, I, I would highly suggest that uh, you you all read these decisions individually. And at any time that after reading these or or after this meeting, if you have a specific question, many of you already have. But if you have a specific question, I know myself is available. I'm sure Ms. Hammond will be available to answer any questions that you would have concerning these decisions. 
Thank you, Todd. Any questions, comments from Mr. Henry or Ms. Hammonds? Any questions or comments? Thank you very much for the time I spent on this. Okay, the second item is a resolution <coughs> rescinding the previous council resolution 6306. And Todd, you are, did you came yes, to take the order? Yes, I drafted this resolution at the request of uh, uh, council person uh, team. And uh, uh, at this point, I would I would uh, just uh, hand it over to him for explanation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to acknowledge first of all that uh, you know, this is probably one of the most emotional issues that we have here at the at the Cherokee Nation today. Identity is important to all of us, and its implications for our, our nation. Uh, are indeed serious. Um, I've watched some of this issue previous to being a member of this body and I've always been concerned uh, about any actions that uh, may diminish the, the, the Cherokee Nation. Um, we have a ruling from our own Supreme Court that uh, the descendants of the Freedmen are indeed citizens. I believe uh, the numbers somewhere around 3,000 uh, that are that have been granted citizenship cards um, and all of the uh, associated rights along with it. Uh, and there's several hundred that are in, in the loop there. Uh, this issue seems to be the, the center for me for many of our, our problems that we have. Uh, certainly there's evidence of uh, a federal ruling here uh, regarding uh, civil rights on a, on a national level. Um, one that may change the entire course for all Indian tribes, uh, whether or not we do have full say over our, our tribal membership. Uh, there are some precedents out there with some of the other five civilized tribes, uh, particularly with the, with the Seminole Nation, where uh, once disenfranchised, the federal government intervened and actually froze the, the federal budget of that nation until those rights were uh, restored back to them. Um, I believe that uh, there is a, uh, a separate petition that has been initiated by citizens of, of our nation. It has cleared through our Supreme Court and it has been authorized. Where the people have the right to vote on this. Uh, I do not believe that all the people realize what implications might happen if we do vote to disenfranchise these citizens. Uh, I brought forth this measure as an opportunity for us to begin to restore unity among the Cherokee Nation. I believe that this, uh, if we rescind this motion today, it does not affect the petition that's out there. Uh, the petition stands on its own to call for a special election. However, if we vote to rescind this, I believe that we will uh, bring ourselves out of uh, a constitutional crisis. We would agree with our Supreme Court that these are indeed citizens. Uh, this lawsuit is going to play out for some time, um, and you know we have our best counsel on that, and we will uh, react to that accordingly. But I believe that uh, if we rescind this today, we can begin to uh, unify our great nation once again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. King. I would entertain a motion to uh, approve so <coughs> we can continue further discussion. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Now it's open for discussion. Uh, Ms. Cowan, well, I thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, one of our attorneys, they'd be so kind. Is the seminal decision not distinctly different because the freedmen in their tribe were excluded from voting at the time that they were then removed from citizenship? <laughs> I'll make a crack. <laughs> uh, the, the Seminole decision and the Cherokee Nation uh, position that we found ourselves in are very similar. Uh, uh, depending, uh, you know, being an advocate, you can you can make distinctions uh, wh wherever uh, you know wherever they wherever they may be. Um, uh, can a distinction be made? 
sure, a distinction can be made. Uh, can the argument be made that, you know, wearing the other hat, as Mr. Garvin has often told me to do, um, uh, uh, can an argument be made that they are the same? Sure. I mean, it, it really goes down to lawyer. Uh, both ways. I mean, it can, you know, you can make that argument both ways. I'm asking about a particular part of that case, and that the reason it seemed like to me that they had excluded inappropriately citizens was that they had not included them when the vote was taken to exclude them. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the seminal case here in front of me, but I'm very happy to, to, to get it and, and to write a specific opinion on that, uh, along with my service handling. And the reason I hesitated was because it's hard for me to separate what we're talking about with the vote from the from the van case in D.C. The van case in D.C. centers upon allegations that the plaintiffs were not allowed to vote in the 2003 election. If we set that aside and consider in a vacuum this issue, those descendants of freedmen will be allowed to vote on this issue as to whether or not they remain in the tribe. So in my research, I found that any time you try to expatriate someone, or disenfranchise someone, if we say uh, you have to be a half Cherokee to be a member, we would be expatriating, disenfranchising, probably most of us in this room, myself included. And we could do that. We would have to be very explicit in our vote on doing that and we would have to allow everyone to vote on it. So that may be a circuitous way of answering that, but that's the best I can do. Okay. How might uh, a vote on this resolution and rescinding it potentially impact the federal lawsuit or any other cases that are out there? I, I don't know. I mean, there's a separate um, petition uh, or a separate initiative by the people um, undoubtedly, whatever you decide to do will be used by one side or the other um, as arguments for or against. Uh, it seems to me the primary effect is to go for arguments. Appreciate your candy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sir Franklin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Right. Uh, you know, and, and this, this really got us torn up. And uh, I'm not against taking anybody's rights away from them. But, uh, you know, the people the people spoke with the petition and issued a petition. It went through the news. And Justice Leeds, and she said in her first opinion that the Cherokees have the right to determine their citizenship. And I put a lot of faith in that. And, uh, and so Mr. Ketcher and, and some of these folks, they did the petition. They did it the right way. It was scrutinized. It, was, uh, it went through the court. It was... Uh, uh, picked apart and uh, and it came out and uh, and it gave the citizens the right to vote and uh, and to bring something forward like this uh, is, to me is taking the right away from what the Cherokee citizens want and I'd like to yield just about a minute of my time to uh, Mr. Keyes in the back would you like to speak on this this is a moment Mr. Keyes uh, I just want some clarification. Uh, Ms. Dean, this speaks to the June election, is that correct? Or is this yes, this speaks to the June election. Okay, I think Mr. Uh, Angle is speaking to the uh, petition election scheduled supposedly in March. Is that right? That's correct. This would not affect this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This, that's not the main this particular petition for mm -hmm. so, uh, My understanding is you want to continue, Mr. Anglin, or amend amend that in any way? Yes, I, I'd like for Mr. Keith to go ahead and, and uh, think because he's done a lot of research and everything. And, uh, well, basically, speak, he's one of my constituents. He I'm wants to speak to the June election? That, that'd be fine. Okay. Uh, he, he wants to speak to this resolution. Okay, Mr. King, uh, two minutes, please. Certainly. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, I ask you to allow me to speak uh, on this issue. Uh, this is a very volatile issue, but bottom line is that uh, what I think that Taylor has introduced is really absurd. 
I think that number one, it's political suicide, and number two, I think it's hierarchy uh, communism. Basically, what you're saying here is that if you support this, that you're wanting to take the Cherokee's voice order away from us. We're not going to talk about communism no. And, no. and talk to the counselor in this body. Will you keep it general, Mr. King, yes. and not make it personal, please? Thank you. Thank you. But bottom line is that, that I just can't agree with this because uh, that, that is striking at the very heart and foundation of our Constitution, the right of the voice of the people. So if you, uh, you know, support this uh, measure, then how in the world are we ever going to settle this measure? Irregardless of the vote and how people vote on it, I think that we need to get this thing voted on and get it behind us. That's all I have to say. Thank I you. apologize oh, if I have anyone have any questions? Mr. King? Not a... Not a yeah. Oh, I think Mr. Barton was... Let <coughs> look at this different than everybody else. I think we could. <laughs> but what this is doing to me is, is that we let the people go out and pass the petition, <coughs> get a special election called for by the principal chief. And to me, that knows the June uh, vote. You're not going to vote for it in March. You're not going to vote for it in June. So, to me, you need to pull this, this June vote out of the election. Now, I can't see you having two elections for the same thing, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You're going to have one in March. So, I've got to be for this. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Conn, and then Mr. Martin. <coughs> um, Mr. Henry, could you in very simple terms for people like myself <laughs> explain exactly what would happen should this resolution pass? I need to see and hear what will happen if it's passed and what will not happen, or what this, happens if it's not passed. Please. This this is my opinion, and if Ms. Hammond or any other attorney in the uh, room disagree with it, uh, uh, I, I would welcome the comments. There is a standalone petition that has been passed in, uh, through the, the system of the Church of Nation. That election has been called for for March 7th, 3rd, March 3rd of 2007. This resolution that you're debating here today will not have any effect on that process. That process stands or goes as it will. Okay? This resolution is specifically re, uh, uh, re, uh, rescinding resolution number 6306, which if you recall this body passed that called for a special election on citizenship of a Cherokee nation to be held at the general election, which will take place in June of 2007. If you vote to rescind that resolution, there will be no election in June of 2007, and the Cherokee Nation Council is taken out of this process. That's as brief and succinct as I can put it. Ms. Hammond, if you want to comment. Yes. Bruce Connor, is that all right? Yes, please. Um, and this doesn't have anything, I, I don't disagree with what you said, except that I think <laughs> we would be remiss in um, somehow implying that um, there's nothing left to do as to the people's um, petition and initiative. Uh, the ballot title came to my office uh, on December 26th. On January 3rd, we issued a, a letter to the Cherokee Nation Election Commission. Uh, we reviewed the proposed ballot, um, rejected it as written, and made uh, a couple of uh, changes to it, sent that back to the, the Election Commission on January 3rd. There is a 10-day protest period after we send that back to the Election Commission, and that period has not expired. We haven't mentioned that, and perhaps it has nothing to do with the issue of opinion. But I did want to, to say that publicly, that, that is still, that uh, contest period is still running. 
and I guess that, that would be, you know, that goes to the initiative petition process that is still going, as I said, that either stands or goes as it is. It is not a complete process, as uh, Ms. Ham has just stated, that there is valid language that we still, if that's the third, we're the fifth here, that you're still within a 10-day protest period as to the ballot language if anyone should uh, want to protest that language. Additionally, on January 10th uh, of, this, of this year, there's been a special meeting of the council to confirm the special election date pursuant to statute uh, concerning the special election that has to do with this election. So there are two items out there still left as to, uh, concerning the initial petition. Ms. Connor, you said so. If this is passed, then there's a, then we'll have the election in March. This doesn't affect that. That still happens. But then it's not on the June ballot. Is that right? As this is, if you pass this, there will be no June election on this issue. You still have the initial petition process that is ongoing. And the special election. And the special election that's been March. called for on, on March 3rd. So let me ask this. Why would we why would we need to have it in on the ballot in That's June? your decision. <laughs> I mean I that's what I'm I mean, is there any logic or reason why we would need to be here in March and be on the ballot in June? That's what I need clarification on. Uh, Diane I would perceive that as a rhetorical question that the body would, would, would need to answer. Are there anything else? It's clear as mud. Mr. Martin and then Ms. Callum Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. He, he answers the question. question. Okay. Ms. Callum Watts. Uh, it seems like to me that this is potentially a way to hamper the vote, the Cherokee people's right to vote on the issue. Because if we time it now, we rescind the June ballot without ensuring that the March 3rd election occurs, then we allow other folks to hamper the petition process by the Cherokee people and mess with it and play with it until it's passed even the June election if we don't have backup and make sure that we are as an elected official of the Cherokee Nation that we're not representing the people that signed this petition and saying yes we want you to vote on it whether it occurs March 3rd or June. So it seems like to me this is another way to to kind of chip away at the the petition <coughs> process that our Cherokee people went through that we could just wait until after March 3rd, make sure it happens, and then remove it from the ballot. Yeah. If that, that, that scenario could occur, correct? Well, in that scenario, as you know, and, and, and we're, trying, we're, we're kind of bleeding from questions into debate. It seems like to me this is yeah. early. But when that is a policy decision by the council, and I don't want to <coughs> intrude into, into <laughs> that realm. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Baker? Yes, and, and Todd, let me clarify something that you just said a minute ago. You said that if we rescind this, that the uh, June, it could, the issue could not be on the June ballot. However, let's say in, in worst case scenario, the there's a protest on the uh, the language, or the dates aren't approved, or something like that takes place. Then, would not the, the people's petition come at the next general election if there was not a special election? The petition is, it stands on its own. It has been certified by the court. <coughs> is that correct? It has been. And so, if for some reason there wasn't a special election, would it not come up the next regular election? I, the people's petition. I'm reading it. I don't know, and I, I, I I'm going to not go out there on a limb because because the amendment because because the the initial language says this: We, the undersigned legal voters of the Cherokee Nation, respectfully order 
that the following proposed constitutional amendment shall be submitted to the legal voters of the Cherokee Nation for their approval or rejection at a special election called for the purpose uh, of this proposed amendment to the uh, Constitution of the Cherokee Nation. Now, I don't know if that language would specifically limit it to a special election or it would fall over into a general election. I'm not prepared to make comment for that call. Diane, do you have a thought on that? Um, Councilman Baker, I was looking at the Constitution uh, to see if there's anything that I haven't done. <coughs> all right, all right. While you look, let me ask a, a second question. Come general election time, would the language not have to be looked at for the, for 6306 and would there not be a challenge at that point as well? 6306 has its language specifically in there and it either, uh, you can't change that language. That is the council's language. Now if someone wants to, to, to challenge it after it's passed saying that it's, you know, or, or or, or, or mess with the, or, or take contention with its interpretation, well, that's what lawsuits are for. But the, but uh, Resolution 6306, that language is, is there. And that's because that was language passed by the council. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It sounds like it's uh, many questions and Bounce and whatever, I'm going to make a motion to table this second. issue. Move to table and second it. All in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. Roll call and the motion is to table. Yes, it's to table. Bill Anglin? Yes. Bill John Baker? No. Jack Baker? Yes. Arthur Connor? Yes. Joe Crinton? No. Don Garvin? Yes. Chuck Hoskins? Yes. Bill Johnson? Yes. Taylor Keene? No. John Keener? No. Jack Bob Martin? Yes. Lynn O'Leary? No. Now Bobby Shop House? Yes. Taylor Thornton? No. Fair Kyle Watt? Yes. Louis Jarvie? Yes. Mary Freddy? Yes. Ken Yay? Ten to table and six no. Six no. Move to adjourn. Second. Uh -huh. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 aye.